Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Last week on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. In 1984, author Joe Fisher came into contact with an unusual woman, a leukemia patient. She had turned to hypnosis to help with health and pain management. While under hypnosis, she began to receive messages from spiritual guides. Soon, Joe Fisher was part of a group that was regularly attending her sessions, and Joe got to know his own guide, a woman named Philippa, with whom he had shared an incarnation in 18th century Greece. But Joe was a paranormal author and investigator, and the guides encouraged his ambitious plan to travel internationally and verify that the guides had really lived as the historical individuals they claimed to be so that he could validate their important messages. So what happened when Joe Fisher went to check out their claims? What evidence did he discover? And what did he eventually conclude? In fact, Joe was planning another verification trip to Europe, and this would be a big one. He had plans to verify the existence of three of the group's guides. One was Aviva's guide, Russell, who had been a shepherd in 19th century England. Another was Tom's new guide who had replaced Ernest. This was the World War I soldier, Harry. And the third was his own guide, Philippa. To verify her existence, he was going to his beloved land of Greece and walk the streets that they had walked together. Through Aviva, Joe thus interviewed Philippa, gathering as much information as he'd need to verify the details of their lives together and her own existence. However, before he could leave for Europe, Joe had an unexpected encounter. It so happened that I ran into Sanford Ellison at a house party only days before I left Toronto. He looked awful. Drawn and defeated, he exhibited all the signs of physical and emotional exhaustion. I was not inclined to spend much time in Sanford's company because Russell had left us little doubt about his regressive behavior. Besides, the party's hubbub forbade serious discussion. But one comment made during our brief chat was to remain with me all the way to Greece and back again. Anytime you're ready to hear about the other side of the guides, Sanford said somewhat cryptically, I'll be glad to tell you all I know. And that's what we'll tell you next time. The other side of the spirit guides that Joe and Sanford had encountered. You're listening to episode 311 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about how Joe Fisher discovered that his spirit guides were actually hungry ghosts. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1984, author Joe Fisher began investigating a group of spirit guides they were communicating through a medium he called Aviva Newman, and they had a huge impact on his life. His own guide was a woman named Philippa, who he had lived a previous life with in the 1700s in Greece. She was his ideal woman, but he was planning on writing a book about the guides, and he needed verification of their claims. So he was planning a big trip to Europe to check out their claims. What happened when Joe Fisher went to Europe? What evidence did he uncover? And what did he eventually conclude? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, where did we leave our mystery last week? Well, Joe Fisher had already conducted one trip to Europe to check out the claims of Aviva's spirit guides. Uh, that was to investigate the claims of a guide named, named Ernest, who said that he had been an English pilot in World War II named William Alfred Scott. And although some of what he said did check out, Joe couldn't find any record of William Alfred Scott himself. This shook his faith in the guides, and his mother told him that she thought he was talking with demons. Joe then broadened his investigation to include other channelers besides Aviva, but he only found one that seemed to have even partial credibility. That was a woman named Claire LaForgia, and she channeled the spirit of a gentleman named Dr. Samuel Pinkerton, who had been an English surgeon from the 19th century. Now, Joe is going to Europe to investigate three of Aviva's guides, 
her own guide, Russell, Tony Zambellis' new guide, Harry, and Joe's guide, Philippa. But before he left for Europe, Joe had an unexpected encounter with Sanford Ellison, the man who had temporarily led Aviva's group and been her personal healer. He told Joe, Anytime you're ready to hear about the other side of the guides, Sanford said somewhat cryptically, I'll be glad to tell you all I know. So that's where we stand. Joe is about to go to Europe for his grand verification trip, and Sanford has cryptically offered to tell Joe about the other side of the guides. What did Joe do once he got to Europe? The first guide he decided to check out was Tom's guide, the World War I soldier. This was logical, since it would be easy to check the war records to verify his service and his death in 1917. And so, the guide, Harry Maddox, had been really open and free with information about his life. Joe said that he was effectively the comedian among Eva's guides, so he was really easy to get along with. Joe thus went to an archive in Europe and looked him up. William Harry Maddox, with an X he had stipulated, was on my mind. Of the three guides who now commanded my research interest, he was the most recently incarnate, and theoretically the easiest to locate. I squeezed my way through the crowd in search of the ledgers for 1917, the year he was killed. Harry had given 17 August as his date of death, but on another occasion had expressed the possibility that he might have died in October. Such a minor variation was unlikely to pose any difficulties, however. August to October inclusively could be scanned within a few minutes. I retrieved the several volumes which bore the dead of 1917 and the births of 1895, the year Harry said he had appeared in the world. First, I made directly for the dates Harry had given. To my disappointment, there were no listings in his name. And so I expanded the search progressively until all four quarters of 1895 and 1917 had been scrutinized. Still nothing. My stomach clenched in remembrance of Ernest, and fighting off frustration and anxiety, I turned to consult the wartime directory of deaths, other ranks, 1904 to 1920. William Harry Maddox was not there either. I could hardly believe it. Harry, I protested inwardly, was so candid, so disarming, so lovable, so obviously a World War I veteran. How could he? Perhaps, I told myself hastily, he had ended up in a mass grave and his death had never been registered. But even if that were true, his birth should have been recorded. I could feel my agitation growing, and I knew that no matter what the emotional cost, I must face the worst, the very worst, that these mute registers could throw at me. This is not to say that everything in Harry's story failed verification. Like Ernest, some of the big picture stuff he said was verifiable. For example, his overall unit, the 18th Division of the Royal Corps of Engineers, did exist. And it did have people who did the job that Harry said he had, which was working as a stringer or a man who ran telephone communication lines between trenches. And the unit did fight where Harry said it did. But of Harry Maddox himself, there was absolutely no trace. Reluctant to confront my worst fears, I felt locked into an extended process of betrayal. Even as I hoped that everything would turn out all right, that there had been some colossal oversight on my part. In the meantime, I resolved to check against the records and registers every statement made by the guides that lent itself to verification. Flagging optimism notwithstanding, personal and professional curiosity demanded that the pathway I was treading be followed until the end. He thus returned to checking out the claims of Aviva's own guide, Russell. Russell didn't have as friendly a personality as Harry did. He could be rather abrupt. But he wanted Joe to check him out, and he had given him lots of information that could be cross-checked. My file on Russell's last life was already well-stocked with information from a lengthy question-and-answer session conducted earlier. Born in Harrogate, Yorkshire, he had grown up to become a dashing young man, a farmer who tended a flock of 30 to 50 sheep and other sustaining animals on 25 acres of land in the Yorkshire Dales. His property, he said, was bordered on the north side by a stream called the Burn Gill, which ran into the River Nidderdale 
pronounced Nitherdale by Russell. In fact, his farm was situated in the crook of land shaped by the confluence of the two watercourses. On this farm called Hetherington, Russell and his wife Mary had raised a family of three children. A fourth child had died as a tiny infant. Heatherfield was said to be the name of the closest village. There is only one street, he said. There is only one church, five houses surrounded by farms, a pub called the Black Lion, and that is all. Harrogate, the nearest town, was a good day's ride or a little over a day with the carriage. Russell would also travel to Skipton, a little further afield, where he would purchase dry goods and fruit and vegetables when they were available. Wool and meat merchants journeyed to Hetherington Farm twice yearly from the city of York, and on one occasion from Cumbria on the far side of the Pennine Hills. Russell told of landmarks in the area, a prominent ridge called Great Wernside, which he pronounced Great Wernsey, and a Druid's temple made of stone, which was half a day's ride from northeast of his farm. The farm north of Hetherington was called the Glen and owned by Walter Smythe. I may not have been able to read and write, said Russell, but I do remember he spelled his name with a Y. To the south, closer to the town of Pateley Bridge, lived Angus Fellows, who fell from his horse and died a lingering death seven years before Russell himself passed away. Russell's death, which he did not want to discuss, was brought on by consumption combined with chest diseases and a minor farming accident. The accident caused him to be confined to my cot, as he put it. As his condition worsened, he was carried into Heatherfield for medical help, death taking hold after he was laid on the floor of St. Mary's Church. I was intrigued that Russell was reluctant to talk about his death. Philippa, too, had shied away from discussion when I inquired about the manner of her passing. Knowing that they were immortal, why were the guides so touchy about death? When I reminded Russell that he had given 1852 as the date of his death, he moved to correct me. I think that's too soon. Why would you give me 1852 if you weren't sure? I asked. Dates, dates, the bane. Oh, the young queen was on the throne. Queen Victoria was crowned in 1837. Let me clarify something. I didn't bother bringing dates with me, not from any of my incarnations. I generalize, yeah. I have to. But dates are not important. They are of no value to me. They're of no value to you, either. You are also one who discards them completely. All I can tell you is that I believe that I was around 48 to 52 years of age. That I do know. I was beginning to feel a little under the labors of that. Probably, though, I couldn't swear, I could nithy swear, my death could have occurred around the early 1870s. Oh, days, weeks, dates. Interestingly enough, in the earliest days of communication, before Russell spoke with his own voice, the alter consciousnesses had relayed Russell's death as 1823 to 1871. Russell went on to explain that although his name was Parnick, he might appear in the records under either Nichols or Parr because his name had been formed by fusing his mother's surname Nichols with Parr, the surname of his mother. She and father decided that the children should have both names. I'm a Parnick as far as I'm concerned. So there was some ambiguity about the family name that Russell might be listed under, and the date of his death was uncertain. But Joe still had lots of information that could be checked out, particularly information about where Russell had lived, what the names of his neighbors were, that the local pub was called the Black Lion, and that the local church was St. Mary's, and Russell was buried in the churchyard at St. Mary's. So once he got to England, Joe also checked the archives for Russell. I pushed through the throng to the shelves which carried entries for the last century and pulled down volume after volume in search of confirmation of the death of Russell Parnick or Russell Nichols. 1870, 1871, 1872, 1873. The years fell to my fingers without yielding a glimmer of familiarity. The sheep farmer has said that he was 19 years old at the time of his wedding, and I looked all the way through 1842 and 1843 in the hope of finding a record of his marriage. Once more, my eyes searched in vain, and my innards screamed in protest. He then went to Yorkshire to check out where Russell had lived and verify his claims about the area. I arrived in Harrogate by lunchtime and headed directly for the reference room of the Harrogate Public Library. 
I was fortunate enough to find an ordnance survey map drawn in 1850 of the area around Pateley Bridge and Heathfield. It was a magnificent map, six inches to the mile and crammed with detail. Every field, trough, well, and shed was marked and every farmhouse mentioned by name. Even sheepfolds were designated, an inclusion that confirmed sheep farming as the predominant farming activity. The Nidderdale, unadulterated by the Gowthwaite Reservoir, which was to be built toward the end of the century, curled fatly to the southeasterly direction, fed on a large S-bend by the slender Burn Gill. On land south of the confluence where I assumed Russell's farmhouse would be, though there was no hint of Hetherington Farm, stood Gowthwaite Hall, presumably the local landowner's mansion. Heathfield lay further south by a good six inches, a village conspicuously without a church. I made a photocopy of the map, then sought out Yorkshire's commercial directories published during the middle of the last century. I looked in vain for the Herons, the McDonald's, and Harrogate's Black Line public house. But I did find the Taylor family, whom Russell said had brought in women's clothes, listed under the subheading Milliners and Dressmakers, as Taylor, Bessie, High Harrogate. But something was dreadfully wrong, and... Whatever it was checked my romanticism at every turn and forced me to consider other possibilities. Was Russell Parnick a name of convenience for a real historical individual who knew the area intimately? Or was Russell a complete imposter who was drawing on someone else's knowledge? Didn't make sense that Russell could be both brilliantly accurate and hopelessly wrong about historical and geographical information. The more I learned about the Nidderdale Valley, the more I was confronted with this maddening dilemma. On a precipitous side street across from the police station stood the Nidderdale Museum, a shrine of local history in glass cases. Owen Brown, the white-haired, bespectacled custodian, led me into a back room where he rummaged through the contents of an antiquated filing cabinet containing family records of the area. I supplied him with three names, Hetherington, Parnick, and Nichols. But each one, in turn, failed to raise a reciprocal echo from the stacks of handwritten white cards. So I was referred to Eileen Burgess, a local historian with the Nidderdale Museum Society who lived down the hill and around the corner. Mrs. Burgess had been poring over family records from Pateley Bridge and District for the past five years but she had never heard of a Parnick or a Nichols in the locality, or a Parr for that matter. Hetherington Farm was entirely unfamiliar to her. Moreover, I was assured that there had never been a St. Mary's Church in Heathfield. Although in Pateley Bridge there was a St. Mary's which had fallen into ruins. The church was closed in 1826, and it was in a bad state of repair then, said Mrs. Burgess. Things were not going well, and Joe was arriving at a very grim point. Regretfully, there was now no question in my mind that Russell, Harry, and Ernest had not lived the lives they had claimed as their own. In vain, I had searched for confirmation in every conceivable corner. Gloomily, I trudged further uphill in the fading light and turned to look back over the rooftops of Pateley Bridge. The wind had dropped, and the little town was cloaked in a pall of mist, thickened by slow trails of smoke rising from nests of chimneys. Higher and wider, the torpor of dusk spread across the valley, swallowing up occasional shouts, traffic noises, and the bleeding of sheep. It was all so magically melancholic that my taut emotions were coaxed from hiding. I felt like crying for the group of believers in Toronto for the guides themselves, whoever they were, for the elaborate deception in which I had become entangled. Now that Ernest, Terry, and Russell had fallen at the hurdle of rigorous scrutiny, only Philippa, my Philippa, was left. And so Joe made the final leg of his journey to Greece. Now, one of the things that he'd done in preparation for his investigation of Philippa was to ask her to speak Greek for him into a tape recorder. In fact, they had been using a few Greek phrases with each other for a long time. For example, they would greet each other with the common Greek greeting, Yasu, which basically means, hello you. 
And after Joe got back from his earlier trip to check out Ernest, Philippa greeted him by saying, Hari kapu se uha, Hari kapu se uha, which Philippa translated as, I'm so happy that you be back. Now, what Philippa said was just transliterated into the Latin alphabet based on what Joe heard on the tape recording. So it wouldn't be super precise, and it might not accurately represent in Latin letters the Greek sounds being used, like the difference, you know, between a rough breathing H and the Greek letter he. But it still looked funny to me when I read it in the book, especially the ending of Harikapu. Um, I speak some Koine Greek, the dialect that the New Testament is written in, but I haven't really studied modern Greek, and I'm certainly not an expert in uh, 18th century Greek dialects. But I'm not aware of pu being a Greek verb ending, and I didn't recognize the word uha at all. So I contacted Professor Daniel Levine of the University of Arkansas, who I met uh, back around 1990 when he asked me to speak to his Greek class that had been studying the book of Colossians in Greek. And he was able to figure out what this mysterious phrase was. He proposed that pu was not the ending of the verb in the sentence, the way it looked in the book. Joe had heard it as if it was part of the verb, but actually it's a separate word meaning something like that. Dr. Levine proposed that what we were looking at was actually a mishearing of harika pu se eda, which I have to say with my koine pronunciation because that's what I know. And this would mean, I am glad to see you, which is close enough in meaning to, I am so happy that you be back. So Philippa passed this test. But Joe also had her speak into a tape recorder, and he played the tape for various native speakers of Greek. One woman said that she couldn't understand it, but it sounded like a mixture of Greek, Bulgarian, and Turkish. Another couple of men said that they could make out one or two words or phrases, but the rest was unintelligible. Of particular interest was what happened when he played the tape for Dr. George Thaniel, a native-born Greek who was a professor of modern Greek in Athens. Most interesting of all was his assertion that Aviva's voice when speaking as Philippa was, in parts, the voice of a Greek woman who hailed from the northeastern region of the country. That in itself was important. If the voice bore traces of one who is Greek by birth and not merely a speaker of Greek, It was likely that a discarnate being, rather than the uncharted realm of Aviva's unconscious, was the source of the communication. The tape's most revealing section concerned Philippa's pronunciation of the name Gavrilos in both a Slavic-sounding dialect and formal Greek. At first, in vernacular which Dr. Thaniel could not understand, she uttered the name with a hard G, before adding, and now in Greek, Yavrilos, with the G pronounced softly. This is a very revealing statement, said Dr. Thaniel. First of all, it was delivered spontaneously and naturally and sounded just like a peasant woman. But most significantly, it directed me to a tiny part of Greek history. Phonetically, she was comparing the modern Greek sound with the old way of speaking. Obscure yet specific information such as this would be very difficult to stage. Dr. Thaniel explained that this simple remark could relate only to the years 1912 to 1920, when unofficial changes in Greek phonetics were institutionalized at the time of Thrace's incorporation with Greece following the Balkan Wars. Therefore, Philippa's reference to Alexandropolis, which was named in 1919 after King Alexandros, would be justified had she been alive in that era. Dr. Thaniel was confident that Philippa's Greek did not belong to the 18th century as she had claimed. Her descriptions of guerrilla fighting between the Turks and the Greeks corresponded with hostilities at the time of the Balkan Wars, and her mention of the drachma was anachronistic. Turkish currency based on a coin called the karush was used in Thrace during the 18th century, the modern drachma being resurrected from classical Greece in 1833. Philippa accurately described the landscape of northeastern Greece, but she did make some cultural errors. The old Greek calendar, which was abandoned in 1923, is 13 days different from ours, and not five, as Philippa had suggested. 
She spoke of people sitting down in church, whereas Greeks have always remained on their feet during services. Dr. Thaniel was mystified by what he heard. At times, he could identify the voice of a Greek speaking through Aviva's voice box, but sometimes the voice sounded more like someone who was learning Greek. So once again, we have an interesting mix of accurate and inaccurate information, according to the expert opinion that Joe got from Dr. Thaniel. It sounded like Filippo was a real native Greek speaker at times, but at other times it sounded like she was just learning Greek. Further, her Greek seemed particular to a specific period of time, the eight years between 1912 and 1920, not the 1700s. Her description of the conflict between Turks and Greeks sounded like the Balkan Wars, which took place in in 1912 and 1913, which also fit the period of her language. She had references to things like the drachma, which didn't exist in the 1700s, but did during the Balkan Wars. And she was just mistaken about the Julian calendar differing from the Gregorian calendar by five days when it should have been 13. So a weird mix of accuracy and inaccuracy, just like with Ernest, Harry, and Russell. What about Joe's investigation of the geography of where he and Philippa had lived in the 1700s? She had said that they lived in a little village in Thrace near the Turkish border named Theros. Uh, But because of the turmoil and other changes that had affected the region in the subsequent years, it was possible that Theros might no longer exist. It might just be a pile of ruins. But Philippa had given Joe a bunch of other geographical indicators that could be used to locate the site, like distances to other locations and to landmarks like mountains. She also mentioned that she had once walked for several days to visit the port city of Alexandrupolis, where Philippa had seen large boats that she described as big, big floating houses. Well, Joe checked everything out, and it turned out that Theros did not exist, at least not in 1987. But that wasn't unexpected for the reasons we mentioned. It may have just been a pile of ruins by this date. However, Joe dug further, and he discovered that Theros never existed, not in the 1900s, not in the 1800s, and not in the 1700s. No town existed where it was supposed to be, and certainly not one named Theros. It was simply an imaginary village. Then there was what he discovered about Alexandrupolis. I retired to the Hotel Orpheus to pursue some tourist leaflets on Thrace, and in particular the city of Alexandropolis. I had always supposed that Alexandropolis was founded by Alexander the Great and had persisted in this belief despite the city's surprising modernity. But as I sat on my bed scanning an awkwardly translated brochure, the distressed truth broke over me suddenly and serendipitously. The brochure said, Alexandropolis is a new city inhabited by many merchants who left eastern Thrace and settled down here in 1850. So it was them who gave a great evolution to the district. The very first name of the city, Didi Goths, was inspired by a Turkish monk, Didi, who had lived and been buried under a huge oak tree in the middle of the central square. The city lay out of the center of the city to the promenade was planned by some Russian military architects during the Russian-Turkish War in 1878. The city became Greek as well as the whole of Thrace on the 14th of May, 1920 and the residents named it Alexandropolis to honor the King Alexandros who visited their place. Several seconds passed before the significance of what I was reading exploded in my dulled mind. How could Philippa had walked for days to see the big, big floating houses at Alexandropolis if Alexandropolis had not existed in the 18th century? Why, the city was named after a 20th century monarch! I had caught Philippa in a devastating anachronism, and even though I had expected disappointment in Greece, such outright dishonesty left me sick at heart and brimming with resentment. My reaction was to throw the pamphlet across the room and yell, bitch, at the walls. But the words sounded hollow and constrained, sad rather than angry. As much as I had been anticipating this moment, my senses rejected what my mind was forced to accept. I could not believe that Philippa, my Philippa, had joined Ernest, Harry, and Russell in blatant falsehood. I just couldn't believe it. 
but I had to believe it. So Joe had given up on Philippa, his guide and dream lover. She had betrayed him with lies, just like the other guides. What did Joe do next? He went back to Canada, determined to have it out with the guides. Returning to Toronto, I was in a volatile state of anxiety and exasperation. An acrid aftertaste was all that remained of yesterday's knowledge, insight, trust, and acceptance. I blamed myself incessantly. Self-loathing clung to every minute of every day, and my future seemed impaled on the necessity of arranging a confrontation with Russell and Philippa. Even though I knew that my book on our so-called allies in the next dimension must be scrapped, Notwithstanding my huge investment of time and energy, the project now had all the appeal of a rotting carcass. How could it be otherwise when the guides I had known and loved had metamorphosed from beings of light into masters of deception? I was angry at Russell, Philippa, and their cronies. But for the first time, I was also afraid of them. If they knew us all so intimately, as they had demonstrated on countless occasions, who could say what power they wielded over our lives? Joe realized that the guides had been experts at manipulation, something we'll have more to say about in the reason perspective, and they had manipulated the members of Aviva's group skillfully. But now that he was no longer listening to the guides, he had reclaimed his own agency, and this gave him a new idea. Instead of fulfilling his forward development for this life by writing a book to spread the teachings of the guides, he would write a book to spread a warning about the guides, to alert people to the dangers that they were involved in, in this kind of thing. And that book became The Siren Call of the Hungry Ghosts. In reclaiming my self-determination, I came to realize that my book project on the guides was not the rotting carcass I had supposed. To a blinkered believer, it might be a rotting carcass, but to an objective observer, a role I was busily recreating for myself, it was a treasure trove of revelation. From my dealings with unbodily entities and my quest for verification of their past lives, much could be learned about the nature of channeling. My ordeal would not be in vain if channelers, their clients, and the New Age movement would heed the implications of my research. Invigorated by the change of perspective, I braced myself for the all-important confrontation with Russell and Philippa. I had wanted to challenge the guides at a full Friday night session, if only because my findings seemed crucial to the life of the group. Aviva, however, declined my request. She said that she did not want to awake from her trance to dissension among the group members. Because much of the past life information was gathered privately, she insisted that the guides also be consulted in camera about the results of my investigation. My plan of action was simplicity itself. Once Aviva was ushered into trance, I would present my findings as clearly and as dispassionately as possible before demanding an explanation for the various discrepancies. Whatever you do, I lectured myself, do not get excited. But Zaviva stretched out on the sofa, and I sat down beside her on the afternoon of Sunday, 13 September 1987. My inner equanimity was mightily threatened by rumblings of tension and vulnerability. What was I up against? Waiting for Russell's sharp, emotionless voice, one thought would not be denied. Perhaps I am talking to demons, after all. But there was little time for such fearful rumination. However, when Joe began to interrogate Russell, he didn't get much satisfaction. Russell did not have an explanation for why Joe hadn't been able to find any records of the guides. In fact, he said he was surprised that he couldn't find any records. He was offended that apparently nobody had made a proper record of his death. He insisted that there must be records that exist and that Joe would find them if he just kept looking. For his part, Joe tried confronting Russell with things he'd said about where he'd lived that had been mistaken. Let me just give you an example of the errors I'm talking about, Russell. I went to your village of Heathfield, which you call Heatherfield, and there is no St. Mary's Church, nor has there ever been a St. Mary's Church in that village. 
and yet when I noticed there was no church symbol on the map, I asked you twice before I set out from Canada. Are you sure St. Mary's was in that village? Yes, indeed. There has never been a St. Mary's church in that village, Russell. There most certainly was. There was a traveling pastor who had come to that church once every month, and in that building, which also operated throughout the month as the residence of one of the local families, there most certainly were services. We made sure that our children received all the rites and passage into the church itself. And the pastor would come once every month unless the weather was extremely bad and he was unable to get through on the roads. But you said that you were laid out on the floor of the church, not a house, a church. That was our abode for our church. And you said that you were buried in a graveyard. According to local records and local historians, there has never been a graveyard there. There's a St. Mary's Church in Patley Bridge, Russell, but not in your village. We would have a traveling pastor who would come and give services in that abode, which was our church. So Russell was trying to explain away the facts that he had said that there was a St. Mary's Church in his village, that he had died on the floor of this church, and that he'd been buried in its graveyard by now saying that the church was actually a family home and that a traveling pastor came by once a month for services, though he didn't explain the graveyard that wasn't there. Joe also confronted him with multiple other inaccuracies in his story, but Russell wouldn't budge. Then he mentioned that Alexandropoulos hadn't even existed when Philippa was alive, so she could not have visited it like she said. And Joe asked if Philippa wanted to say anything about that. No, Russell was adamant. You've shut her out. You've quite completely shut her out. I don't think she'd have the energies. She said, if the value of that truth and love that you've had between you is to be undervalued because you cannot find Alexandropolis, what basis is your life being lived on? Is it being lived only on the superficial, I can touch, I can see, I can feel, or is it being lived in your heart where the truth resides? Russell, it seemed, was withholding Philippa from me in the hope that I would cease my opposition and plead for direct communication with my beloved guide. But my disillusionment ran too far deep. Besides, I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction. Instead, Joe told him that he was now forced to think about other alternatives about the guides. So what are your alternatives? I'd like to hear this. Well, that instead of being a real guide, you might just be a part of your charge's subconscious mind. That you might be a past life personality as you have indicated that other so-called guides are. And I think about people such as Emanuel Swedenborg, the great Swedish clairvoyant, who warned very specifically about communicating with entities in the next world. He warned about the dangers of evil spirits who will use all manner of subtlety, brilliance, and affection to reach you. To what end? I don't know, Russell. You must dig further if you're a true researcher, as you say. To what end would someone give you the information of the type that has been given? To what end would someone open up the learning to you that you have been given? To what end? What would that end entail? I don't know, Russell. The universe is so huge and so wondrous that there's so much we don't know. We just don't know. We're in this physical body. We have a mind to reason and to check and to ask questions. You unfortunately cannot do this outside the earthly framework. Now, when you say this man, Emmanuel, what? Swedenborg, Swedenborg. What was he warning against? He was warning against evil spirits, lower astral individuals. He would warn about the influence of evil spirits who only wanted your downfall. They spoke about love and they spoke about goodness and they ostensibly wanted the best for you, but really, they didn't. But how could you be so downfalled if you are free to choose, free to challenge? Well, we are free to choose. But of course, the guides have influenced everybody in this group. The guides have exerted influence to a great degree. You know that. We only work with our charges. But having been here week after week talking to everybody, you well know the influence that you have over people. We give you information. I do not think we give you influence whatsoever. If you choose to allow it to influence your behavior, that is your choice. We do not offer anything to you that is not asked for. But in as much as you say you are our guides and you want the best for us and you are working with us to help us do better for forward development 
If we accept what you are saying, then of course you're going to influence us. I have told you all along not to accept, and I don't have to justify my existence against your existence. You said to me a long time ago, research your research. I have researched my research, and I have found nobody. So Joe had effectively accused Russell and the other guides of being evil spirits who professed to love and want to help their charges, but who really didn't. And unlike a very pivotal moment at the end of season one of a recent sitcom about the afterlife where a similar accusation was made, Russell did not start chuckling and acknowledge that his evil plot had been exposed. Instead, Russell insisted that he and the other guides were good and that Joe would get the proof he needed if he just kept looking. Had we talked all night, Russell would never have admitted any intent to mislead. He was as slippery as the proverbial eel and a master psychologist to boot. Knowing that he would continue to blame me for my failure to find evidence of the guides, I left the field of battle. This left Joe to ponder what to make of Aviva's guides. One of the things he did was reconsider whether Dr. Pinkerton might be an honest spirit. You'll recall from last week that he was a spirit channeled by a different medium named Claire LaForgia, and Dr. Pinkerton had been able to come up with some accurate information about Philippa, but Aviva's guide said he wasn't a, spir a real spirit at all. Instead, they said he was one of Claire's past life personalities that was manifesting through her, and she was mistaking him for a spirit. Joe writes, I left for Europe confident that Dr. Pinkerton was a charlatan. But on my return, beset with doubts, I wondered whether I had judged him too harshly. I asked myself whether the affably disquieting surgeon had been the victim of a smear campaign by Philippa and her cronies. After all, who were they to label him a mere past-life personality when their assertions about themselves had so miserably failed the test of scrutiny? Besides, Dr. Pinkerton appeared to have known that they were up to no good, having warned that I would be disappointed in my search for evidence in England and Greece. However, my strongest incentive to reevaluate Dr. Pinkerton's credibility strand from Claire LaForgia's insistence that she had located in Belfast the discarnate's great grandson, a gynecologist bearing the family name. Claire told me that she was in the process of arranging an appointment with the Belfast doctor so that we could both travel to Northern Ireland where she would enter trance and present the gynecologist with his departed ancestor. Joe thus asked for a session with Claire and put it to Dr. Pinkerton that Aviva's guides might be earthbound spirits rather than real guides. That's a term that many listeners will not be familiar with. What is an earthbound spirit? I assume it's not a spirit that is currently alive on Earth. No, earthbound spirit is a term of art in the spiritualist community. The idea is that when we die, we are initially in a transitory realm that's adjacent to earth, but then we move on to another realm, which is sometimes spoken of as going into the light. There is evidence for something like this in near-death experiences, which we talked about way back in episode 27, so you can go to mysterious.fm slash 27 for more information about those. But one of the most commonly reported things in near-death experiences is that people who have them will initially seem to be here on Earth, but in spiritual form, so that they can, for example, look down at their bodies and see the doctors and nurses working on them. But then they travel to another realm, and at some point, they may be told that there's a point they can't cross, and then they're told that they're going back, that this isn't their time to die, or they're given a choice of whether they want to go back or stay in the afterlife. Either way, you seem to first be in a transitional area, and then there's a kind of barrier or point of no return to life. We also have an indication of a transition between different places in the afterlife in Jesus's parable of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 19, where Jesus says that after Lazarus the beggar died, he was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. So there's a transition in the parable between where Lazarus was when he died on earth and where he ended up with Abraham. Well, the idea is that not all souls move into the afterlife to the higher beautiful realm like Abraham's bosom, at least not immediately. Instead, some spirits are unable to let go 
of their earthly lives and move into the light. They're still bound or tied to the earth, and so they're called earthbound spirits. And since they're unwilling to move on in the way they should, they may be some of the less spiritual spirits. In other words, they may be spirits that need a lot of purification before they're ready for heaven, or they may even be lost souls. One way or another, you don't want to end up as an earthbound spirit. And what happened when Joe suggested to Dr. Pinkerton that Aviva's guides might be earthbound spirits? He was more inclined to place the blame for what Joe found on Aviva. Uh, He noted that she was a spontaneous medium rather than one who had been properly trained. So she might not be good at contacting the right spirits. And thus she left herself open to being influenced by earthbound ones. So these earthbound spirits, I persisted, are the dead who have lived rather unsavory lives and are hanging around and... Yes, cried Dr. Pinkerton loudly. These lost souls. He uttered the phrase with an attenuated cry of pain. These lower entities, they come in with great knowledge. They come in with love. They want you to believe in them. They are quite clever. They say that they do not control your will. Oh, no, no, no. They have a very lovely, sweet way to control you completely. Do you understand me? But what is to tell me that you, that I am not of the same? I shall tell you why, son. For many years, I have been bouncing in and out of my instrument, that is Claire, controlling organs, blood pressure, heartbeat, and so on and so forth. Nothing bad has ever happened to her. She has never been possessed. I do not allow any lower entities around my instrument. But Aviva, she must stop at once. She's a very good medium, you know, and she could channel very well, but she must retreat into herself for a while and have the proper training. If not, give her twelve to twenty-four months, and you shall hear some very difficult news. Someone that comes through her shall remain there, and we shall have to do an exorcism on this young lady. So, Dr. Pinkerton was alert to the spiritual dangers that Aviva was in. But still, Joe wanted evidence that he was not also a deceiving spirit. Dr. Pinkerton discussed how Aviva's guide, Russell, was a master manipulator, and he called him a serpent. He assured Joe that he would never try to manipulate anyone the way Russell had. But Joe thought he detected signs that Dr. Pinkerton could also be manipulative and deceptive. One of the things that Dr. Pinkerton had claimed was that they had found living relatives of his in Brussels, Belgium, and Vienna, Austria. He had given their names. Also, he had indicated that he had a living relative in the UK named Dr. George Albert Pinkerton. So, Joe did some further investigation. On 6th February 1988, I had my final audience with Dr. Pinkerton. Turning my investigative eye at last on the information he had provided, I discovered that the relatives he had named in Brussels and Vienna were nowhere to be found. Most revealing of all was the absence of his third claimed British Medical Directory for 1987 contained no name of a doctor under that name. Harboring incipient anger and distrust, I confronted Dr. Pinkerton in the gloom of his consulting room. To start with, He behaved as though he hadn't heard my declaration that the records bore no listing for a Dr. George Albert Pinkerton. Watching Dr. Pinkerton perform his verbal dance, I condemned myself for acceding for so long to a being who, professing love and friendship, has done nothing but cajole and mislead with falsehood after falsehood. Something inside wanted to explode, but I smothered the impulse knowing that any expression of anger would only be used against me. Responding with as much calm as I could muster, I refused to be diverted from the matter at hand. The British Medical Directory lists all medical practitioners in the British Isles. There's no George Albert Pinkerton listed as a doctor. That's nonsense, retorted Dr. Pinkerton. 
They're insisting here that you will find George. I don't see any problems. We had to agree to differ. Joe also made contact with the gynecologist in Belfast that Claire had said she had located and who was one of Dr. Pinkerton's descendants. But he wrote Joe and told him that Claire was wrong, that none of his grandparents or great-grandparents had been physicians, that they were all born and died in Ulster rather than being from Great Britain, like Dr. Pinkerton had said. So Dr. Pinkerton turned out to be just another lying spirit. Joe writes, Who are these entities, really? The answer to that question is as unwelcome as it is unavoidable. Months of soul-searching and examination of the evidence left me in little doubt that earthbound spirits or hungry ghosts have wormed their way into that juicy apple of spiritual regeneration known as the New Age. So Joe concluded that the guides were manipulative, earthbound spirits, that they had some kind of psychological need that they were fulfilling by pretending to be people that they were not. And because of this psychological need, he called them hungry ghosts, even though they're not the same as the hungry ghosts you hear about in Asian religions, specifically in Chinese Buddhism and Chinese traditional religion. And we may talk about those hungry ghosts in a future episode. Do you agree with his assessment? I'll tell you what I think of the possibilities when we get to the faith and reason sections, but here, let's look at how Joe reasoned his way through the options. Whatever the voices represented, and however betrayed I felt by the spirits, I believe that conscious fraud on the part of the mediums was not a factor. Having observed the trance state on innumerable occasions, having witnessed marked personality changes reflected by a host of different accents and intonations, and having received a considerable amount of accurate information that could only have been acquired paranormally, there was no doubt in my mind that the mediumship itself, particularly in the cases of Aviva and Claire, was genuine. Multiple personalities can also be dismissed from contention because multiple personalities always claim the same lifespan as the host individual. Past life personalities, too, can be discarded because if genuine, relatively recent life histories would lend themselves to verification in historical records. And this was not the case. Unconscious fraud is not so easily repudiated, however. Joe thus thinks that several theories are incorrect. Uh, the guides were not the result of conscious fraud by Aviva or Claire because their performances as different individuals were too varied and too good to be faked, and because the guides had information that they could only have gotten paranormally. The guides were not multiple personalities of Aviva and Claire because they said they lived in the past, while the alternate personalities of people with dissociative identity disorder, or multiple personality disorder as it used to be called, claim to be alive today. You know, they're talking to you right now, and uh, they're living now. Uh, and the guides could not, Joe thought, be past life personalities, because if they were, then they lived recently, and their recent lives should have checked out when Joe researched them. On the other hand, Joe was open to the idea that Aviva and Claire might have been committing unconscious fraud. That is, the guides might be a product of their subconscious or imagination, though they would still need to be using psychic abilities to pick up on the accurate information that the guides had. Still, Joe thought it was more likely that they were earthbound spirits. The most likely reason for the guide's hit and misses is that they had lived before in the locations they described so well. Because of their intention to deceive, however, their memory would be purposefully selective, and they would impart only enough accurate information to convince us of their earthly presence. The untruths and omissions testify to their parasitic behavior and penchant for making mischief. Yet still the question nags, why would they lie about their identities? If bent on deception, would they not appear all the more believable if they were to provide the real names? Perhaps the solution to this riddle lies in their well-concealed dread of non-physical existence. If they gave their real names, they would be forced to confront their deaths. And such a confrontation, which is clearly avoided at all costs, would activate their most hideous nightmare that they no longer exist physically. 
No matter how I mold over the range of possible explanations, I always return to the premise that the voices and their distinct personalities were generated by mischievous and possibly malevolent discarnates. Their eagerness to communicate, their concern for the medium's health and strength, their preoccupation with life after death and reincarnation, and the occasional admission that they miss the pleasures of incarnate life, all suggested humans who no longer had physical bodies yet longed to live and breathe once more. Just as the famed entity Seth, who had been channeled by Jane Roberts, occasionally asked for a glass of wine or beer and claimed to enjoy the material realm through Jane Roberts' senses. There were indications that Dr. Pinkerton and Russell hungered for vicarious sexual thrills. Russell and Philippa refused to discuss their deaths and declaimed, we're not spirits, as if unhappy with the postmortem condition. Dr. Pinkerton claimed to know so much about earthbound spirits, uttered the phrase lost soul with a prolonged cry of anguish. I was intrigued by these clues, but most of all, I pondered the significance of the lying and manipulation channeled in the exalted name of guides and spiritual teachers and camouflaged as love, wisdom, and solicitousness. And I concluded that if these various entities were to gratify themselves by tasting physical life, they had no option but to wrap their true intent in the guise of virtuousness. Only if they were seen as emissaries of the highest would their counsel be regularly requested. Only if they concealed their identities would they be unencumbered by the past. For ten years, Dr. Joel Witten studied the trance utterances of several mediums while conducting research as a member of the Toronto Society for Physical Research. In that time, he learned that many of the voices he engaged in conversation belonged to mischievous, discarnate entities who would pose as whatever the inquirer, either consciously or unconsciously, wanted them to be. He also discovered that these entities were extraordinarily possessive of the body through which they were communicating. So that was the theory that Joe thought most likely. These were earthbound human souls that missed the earthly lives they'd led. That's why they didn't want to talk about their deaths. And it's why they would insist that they're not spirits, just people who are without bodies at the moment. So they tried to recapture some of the earthly experience they had had by entering and speaking through a medium that would give them a renewed sense of embodiment. They would be very possessive of the medium's body, and they would be very preoccupied about its health. They would want to come back into the body frequently, so they manipulated the medium's audience by pretending to offer love and valuable information and guidance that you needed on a regular basis, and that would let them get back into the medium's body regularly. Sometimes they might enjoy physical sensations through the medium, like having alcoholic drinks or having physical contact with another person or even having intimate physical relations with another person, which both Russell and Dr. Pinkerton hinted at. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. We haven't heard about that to this point in the program. Uh, no, since this is a family show, I didn't want to make a big deal out of it, and we're going to cover it only quickly and delicately, but both Russell and Dr. Pinkerton made overtures on behalf of the medium toward her clients. You'll recall that one of Aviva's clients was Sanford Ellison, who for a time was asked by Russell to give her healing treatments where he'd put his hands on her body and channel healing energy into her, who then became a leader of the group for a time displacing Roger and who then suddenly left the group. Well, after he got back from Europe, Joe got together with Sanford to take him up on his invitation to tell him about the other side of the guides. Uh, when he did that, Sanford gave him a real horror story that Joe devotes considerable space to in the book. Basically, Aviva and Russell started demanding that Sanford come over at any time to give her frequent healing treatments and put his hands all over her body. He was at her beck and call and would have to just drop everything and come over, and he was told that if he didn't do this, that she'd die. Furthermore, they were driving a wedge between him and his wife, because his wife was just a soul, whereas he was an entity. 
He didn't have many past life connections with his wife, but he had lots with Aviva. And Russell was constantly telling him, really insistently, that he needed to confess his love for Aviva and she for him. So, that wife you've got, she's not on your level at all, but Aviva is. You have strong past life connections. You really, really need to confess your love for each other. And you really, really, really need to rush over and run your hands all over her body right now or she's going to die. Uh. Yeah, it doesn't take a super genius IQ level to see what's going on here. Russell was trying to alienate Sanford from his wife, which worked for a time, and get her into an adult relationship with Aviva. What about Dr. Pinkerton? What did he do along these lines? It occurred when Joe was first investigating Dr. Pinkerton. During one of the early sessions that he had with him, this exchange occurred. I did not want to discount Dr. Pinkerton. Personally, I found him charming, entertaining, and quite likable despite his elusiveness. I felt that there was a chance he was authentic and that there might be sound reasons for his reluctance to declare himself. But I was disconcerted by and mistrustful of his lavish show of affection toward myself, Philippa, and especially Claire, whose unimpeachable character and unconditionally loving heart were mentioned at every opportunity. I believed Claire when she said that she had no conscious knowledge or recall of her trance state, but I wondered whether she had any unconscious stake in the proceedings. I could not help wondering, too, whether Dr. Pinkerton had named Philippa because I had disclosed her identity to Claire. In the next three sessions, my shaky faith in Dr. Pinkerton was taxed to the limit. He told me that Claire who was said to be enjoying her final incarnation, would be my guide when I next reincarnated in the company with Philippa. Further, I was informed that Claire had been brought into my life as a forthcoming substitute for Aviva, who, said Dr. P., will have come to my world one of these days. Dr. Pinkerton leaned forward. The wise physician's voice grew even more benevolent than usual as if he were prescribing a healthful practice for a favored patient. Philippa's got so much to give, he said, and when there's a female vibration that is sincere around you, she trusts that vibration, and she feels the same as if she's touching you, son, especially through a medium, making love to a medium who pours out love. It is a wonderful, wonderful journey. At first, I couldn't believe my ears. Was he really suggesting that Claire and I become sexually involved? So, yeah, Dr. Pinkerton had suggested that Joe become intimately physically involved with Claire and said that Philippa would approve of this. So both Russell and Dr. Pinkerton were trying to set up their mediums with their clients, which could fit Joe's hypothesis that earthbound spirits wanted to re-experience bodily pleasures through, the, through their mediums. Did Joe consider the possibility that he mentioned earlier that he might be talking to demons? He did consider it, uh, and the final sections of the book are filled with warnings about deceptive spirits. Joe draws these from uh, multiple different religious and spiritual traditions, including Christianity. And in that section, he talks about demons and the dangers they pose. He takes the idea of demons seriously and doesn't dismiss it. So he thought that it was valuable to repeat the Christian warning against them. However, he doesn't definitively conclude that the guides that he had contact with were demons, and he thinks that it's more likely that they were deceptive, earthbound human spirits. What happened afterward? Well, basically, he severed contact with the mediums that he had been in touch with. He published his book, Warning About Mediums and the Kind of Spirits that He Thought They Attracted. He said that a truly advanced spirit really wouldn't want to communicate verbally with the living, so that mediums would be much more likely to attract lower entities. Needless to say, that message was not going to be received well in the New Age community. Joe published the initial edition of his book in 1991, and 10 years later, in 2001, a second edition came out. This second edition had a new chapter at the end, and it disclosed some of the things that had been going on in Joe's life since he broke with the mediums. 
overall, he reported that things got much better for him, and he had finally gotten married. He also reported, though, that he suspected he had been the victim of a psychic attack by the guides. Early in 1988, I was living in a little house facing Adolphus Reach on the northeastern side of Lake Ontario. During this time of soul-searching, while still grappling with the emotional upheaval of pulling away from the guides, I noticed an inflamed swelling over my navel. It was readily apparent that pus was gathering within and fueling this growth, which was painful to touch. I tried to squeeze the suppurating appendage into submission, but without success. A visit to my local doctor was of little help. Somewhat confounded, he could only recommend that I take antibiotics, wash away any discharge from the abscess, and change dressings regularly. He prescribed a mild painkiller to ease my suffering, which would steadily intensify over the days that followed. Joe ended up going to multiple doctors, and at first, none of them were able to help or even knew what they were looking at. So he just went home to wait it out. Outside, the weather turned blustery. As pale sleet thickened into driving snow, my stomach pain intensified. That evening, I had no option but to take a strong painkiller every half hour just to keep the agony at bay. But even such heavy sedation failed to curb the mounting torment. It wasn't long before I realized that emergency action must be taken. Sometime after midnight, I decided to climb the steep slope behind my cabin and drive to the nearest medical refuge. Prince Edward County Hospital in the town of Picton. The climb was difficult. Bent almost double, gripping my stomach, I struggled up the hill. At the top, I hobbled through snowdrifts, blanketing the highway and slumped into the driver's seat of my vehicle. In flying snow on that desolate stretch of highway, I drove for 20 minutes or more, hunched over the steering wheel like a gut-shot cowboy in an unspeakably frigid spaghetti western. Reaching the hospital, I stepped back into the snowstorm and made for the main entrance. The doors were locked, but there was a night buzzer. I pressed it. Twice. An orderly appeared at the window and ushered me inside as, grimacing, I tried to explain my plight. I was asked to lie down on a bed in the small emergency ward. Soon, a nurse was standing at the bedside, peeling away the latest dressing from my navel. At the sight of the oozing inflammation, she exclaimed under her breath, Oh my God. Coming from a nurse, such a remark was hardly encouraging. I was told that the hospital surgeon would see me at the earliest convenience later that morning. In the meantime, an injection of Demerol dispatched me to Dreamland. Shortly after 9 a.m., Dr. Earl Taylor, a short, stocky man with a kindly air, appeared beside my bed. He carefully examined the stricken navel and, unlike the doctors who had preceded him, delivered a diagnosis. You have omphalitis, he said. This condition is rare in adults but occasionally affects newborns. After the severing of the umbilical cord, the navel is a potential portal of entry for organisms and inflammation can occur. I was then carried into a nearby room for an ultrasound scan. A small green screen showed a malevolent growth, like an inverted pyramid lying beneath my belly button. Soon afterward, I was wheeled into an operating room and given a general anesthetic, which, in the split second before I passed out, smelled like the fumes of a gas station. Then Dr. Taylor, a veteran surgeon with 27 years' experience, went to work. He cut into the abscess, drained the toxin, and stitched up my navel. Awaking later in my hospital bed, I felt groggy but relieved to learn that the operation had been successful. Within an hour, my semi-slumber was interrupted by a telephone call. Claire LaForgia was on the line. Joe, how are you? She inquired. Fine, I replied. But, but how did you know I was here? My guide told me. So... Dr. Pinkerton had told her. Not a soul had been notified of my admission to the hospital. My next thought was this. If Dr. Pinkerton had told Claire where I was, perhaps he had put me there. Perhaps he was the source of the strange affliction which had baffled three physicians and had puzzled even the practiced eye of Dr. Earl Taylor. 
So Joe thought that this might have been a psychic attack, and hypothetically, it could have been used to hook him and reel him back in. If he had continued talking with Claire, she might have expressed concern for his ongoing health and wanted him to come in for a healing consultation with Dr. Pinkerton and get him back into consulting with the spirit doctor. But Joe didn't bite. He didn't continue contact with Claire or Dr. Pinkerton. How did things go for Joe after this? Not as well as we would have hoped. Uh, In his piece on Joe, Lewis Proud writes, Unfortunately for Fisher, long-term romantic fulfillment eluded him yet again. The couple divorced in 1999. Joe advised that his marriage to Emily brought him a certain calmness and stability, his brother Malcolm told me. But I don't think that they were particularly well-suited. When they met, she was a successful fashion designer, and he was a successful author. And everything seemed rosy, which was why the downward spiral in fortunes was particularly notable. That Fisher's fortunes took a downward spiral in the final years of his life is undeniable. Along with the emotional pain of divorce, he suffered another kind of pain after sustaining a debilitating back injury. Once an excellent marathon runner, he was forced to stop running altogether. The injury also impacted his ability to write. He told me he'd write sitting in a chair 15 minutes, then standing 15 minutes, then laying on the floor 15 minutes, revealed his friend Kendall. But on a long waiting list for surgery, Fisher suffered greatly in the interim. Yeah, because Canada has a socialized medical care system, and so it often has long waiting lists for needed procedures. This is an unfortunate reality of economics, which is the study of finite resources that have alternative uses. Like anything else, medical care has a finite supply, and these limited resources can be used on different people. So there has to be some way to ration it. One way to ration it is by charging money for it, which has the benefit of financially incentivizing people to go into medicine so that there will be more medical care to go around as more people come into the field and then prices will go down. But if you distort the market with things like insurance for routine medical care or government rationing of medical care, then problems result. Here in America, the insurance system makes the market for medical care far from financially efficient, and it drives up prices outrageously. While in Canada, people don't have a good financial incentive to go into medicine, so there's less medical care and you get long waiting lists. After undergoing a spinal fusion in January 2001, an operation in which the vertebrae are permanently joined together, he reported that the pain had vanished. However, speculates Kendall, the operation may not have been entirely complication-free, perhaps causing post-surgery depression. I personally believe the long suffering ignited a despair, he whose body had always performed so admirably. Fisher's woes were compounded by the likely possibility of having to file for bankruptcy. Writing is hardly a lucrative profession, and to cope with the growing pile of bills, he at one point got a job picking strawberries. Kindle informed me that the lowly nature of the work depressed the once successful author and journalist, who expressed his frustrations at the sight of frivolous teenagers throwing strawberries at each other while on the job. In March 2001, Fisher made plans with Dr. Witten to collaborate on a new book. Aptly, their project was to concern The Dark Night of the Soul, a Christian term from St. John of the Cross that describes a state of spiritual desolation and hopelessness, a period of darkness through which the spiritual seeker must pass on their way towards the light and glory of the dawn. In Fisher's case, however, the dawn hadn't arrived. Around him, there existed only darkness and despair in the form of poor health, broken relationships, and poverty. He was terrified of getting older, observed Dr. Witten. He was dead broke, and the book we were working on wouldn't see any monies coming in for upwards of a year. As well as dealing with money woes, Fisher was deeply saddened by the untimely deaths of several people close to him. In 2000, A friend of his committed suicide by jumping from a cliff at Elora Gorge. Some two years prior, he lost his nephew's soul to suicide. The teenager jumped off a cliff near Brighton, United Kingdom. 
A year later, his nephew's mother, Helen, Fisher's younger sister, overcome by grief, committed suicide by jumping from the same spot. So, yikes. In addition to everything else he was dealing with, in a span of two years, Joe lost three loved ones. His nephew, his younger sister, and his friend. And all three of them leapt to their deaths. So that's what Joe decided to do, too. On May 9th, 2001, he went to Alora Gorge in Ontario, the same place where his friend had leapt to his death. And Joe did the same at the age of 53. God rest his soul. And I invite the listeners to pray for him and for all who have taken their lives. In a final letter to his brother Malcolm, which Fisher posted on the morning of 9 May before taking his life, he declared, Now I have much more sympathy for Helen's plight and realize that the depths of despair cannot be easily vanquished. In the same letter, Fisher added, I know the immortal penalty for taking one's own life is steep indeed, and all avenues out of this nightmare I am in seem blocked and poisoned. The letter in question is one of several that Fisher wrote to various friends and relatives in his final hours. Malcolm told me that his brother, having penned the letters, walked down to the post office to get stamps. He then had a friendly conversation with staff before posting the letters and walking to the edge of the gorge. It seems that he had made a rational decision, which he then carried out. Needless to say, this was a shock to the people who knew Joe or who had read his books in the paranormal community. And there was a question about what role, if any, the guides may have played in his death. The answer is, maybe they did. Lewis Pride reports that his brother Malcolm said, Everything in his life did take a downturn from work and writing opportunities, to relationships, to physical health, to aggravated sleeplessness and financial worries. He was upset at being deceived by the spirits. His sister Jane said, I do remember Joe saying that he felt persecuted by spirits and he was worried for his immortal soul. Joe's co-author, Dr. Whitten, said, Joe did express to me that he felt haunted by dark forces. I don't know if he was actually possessed when he killed himself, but he did speak of being haunted. And according to Lauren Coleman's obituary of Joe, In one of his last communications with editor-in-chief Patrick Queege at Paraview Books, Fisher noted that the spirits were still after him for having written his final book. So those around Joe had at least some reason to suspect that the spirits somehow influenced Joe's decision to kill himself. And with that, we need to look at all of this from the faith and reason perspectives. And before we get to those, we'd like to take a moment now to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including... Connor F., Tom W., Roger F., Derek V., and Daniel Z. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by... DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com and buy Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about Joe and the spirits he reported encountering? Well, as always, we need to look at the full range of possible explanations, beginning with the natural one, since natural explanations are more common than paranormal ones. We thus need to look at whether the spirits were due to deliberate fraud or imagination or mental illness or misunderstanding or whether they were really spirits. And if so, whether they were human spirits or whether they were demons. We also need to look at what role they may have played, if any, in Joe's suicide. What can we say about the spirits from the reason perspective? Could they have been due to conscious fraud? 
In this case, we'd have to ask who it was that committed the fraud, and there are two main possibilities. First, the information we have about them comes from Joe's book, and he uses, he uses pseudonyms to protect people's identities, he says, but maybe Joe himself committed fraud and everything in his book is a lie. Second, if that's not the case, then the mediums he worked with, Aviva and Claire, could be people who committed the fraud. Then let's look at the first possibility. Did Joe commit fraud here? Was his book just a lie? I can't know with 100% certainty. Uh, the reported events began four decades ago, and as I said, the book uses pseudonyms to protect the privacy of individuals, so I wasn't on the scene and I can't personally investigate key claims. But I don't really think Joe was committing fraud. In the first place, what would his motive have been? If you want to write a best-selling New Age book and get famous and make money, you don't want to write a big, huge warning to the New Age community against using channelers. And you especially don't want to do that in the middle of the channeling explosion that started in the 1980s with individuals like Jay-Z Knight and Ramtha. That's the way to lose friends and influence with people in the New Age community of the day. Second, when you read the book, it really, really reads like the person who wrote it was seriously burned by his experience with mediums. Um, the resentment of what happened to him is palpable and shows up repeatedly. It's, it, the book is driven by betrayal and resentment, which is a sign that he's being fundamentally honest, at least about the core of the story. Third, when it comes to the edges of the story, specific details and things like that, the community of people around Aviva were recording all of her sessions. Joe had copies of the recordings, which he based the book on. And if he was falsely reporting what those tapes said, the others could expose him and possibly even sue him. Fourth, we have independent confirmation of Joe feeling resentful or haunted by the spirits from people like his brother, his sister, his co-author, and his editor. So this really is not sounding like Joe was committing conscious fraud in this book. It seems like the story is fundamentally true. What about the idea of conscious fraud being committed by the mediums, uh, Aviva and Claire? We heard Joe's reasons for discounting this possibility. He thought that Aviva would not have been good enough as an actress to pull off the performances she gave in her sessions, and he thought that the spirits had too much paranormal knowledge for it to be fraud. I'm not as confident of these points as Joe was. Uh, in the first place, I don't at all underestimate the ability of people to rapidly and confidently switch between roles, to change demeanor and speech patterns and accents and things like that. So I can't place much confidence in that reason. What about the paranormal knowledge he reported the spirits having? I have a few concerns here. Uh, first, a lot of the time he says that they passed paranormal knowledge tests, like Philippa mentioning things about his life that Aviva didn't know. But he didn't give many concrete examples. Uh, consequently, I can't know whether these were things that really went beyond random chance or not. And maybe Aviva was just cold reading him or making guesses based on his appearance and demeanor. Fraudulent mediums use cold reading all the time, and they can be very convincing to their marks and convince them that they really are in communication with spirits. So without examples, I can't know that this isn't the explanation for a lot of the paranormal knowledge Joe says they had. Second, when Joe does give examples of the paranormal knowledge, it either doesn't go beyond random chance uh, it could be things that Aviva had background knowledge of, like when she said that um, Harry Maddox was a stringer and laid communications lines between trenches in World War I. I mean, that's a job someone might know about just by their background knowledge of the period, like if they've watched World War I movies or TV shows. Or the information is things that Aviva might have specifically researched in order to give a convincing performance. That's a practice in fraudulent mediumship that is known as hot reading. And because none of Aviva's readings were done under laboratory controls, I can't be confident that she didn't get the results she did by a combination of hot reading and cold reading. Third, 
Aviva displayed a pattern of accuracy on general things and inaccuracy on specific things. So she would know general things about a time period or country, but she would fail spectacularly when it came to the details of a particular person who allegedly lived there and then. That pattern is consistent with being a fraud who has a certain amount of background knowledge and who has done a certain amount of research, but who has not researched a specific individual in the time and place in question. Fourth, there's a history of fraud in mediumistic circles. I'm not saying that all mediums are frauds. They clearly are not, and some have passed tests under rigorously controlled scientific conditions. But there have been a lot of frauds. A uh, hundred years ago, the British and American Societies for Psychical Research both exposed tons of frauds and found comparatively few mediums who had anything general, genuinely paranormal going on. There are other explanations for mediumship too, though, like imagination and misunderstanding, but frauds were more common than those that were genuinely evidential among mediums. Given all that, I can't rule out the conscious fraud hypothesis the way Joe does, at least not without having been there and having been able to do my own investigation. What about the possibility that the spirit guides were due to innocent imagination on the part of the mediums? No, here I don't see this as a possibility. Uh, Aviva did produce accurate knowledge on some things that went beyond random chance. That information, thus, would not be due to her merely imagining that she was in contact with a spirit and imagining what the spirit might say. It had to be something else, either fraud by hot reading or her own ESP or contact with a spirit. But it wasn't just innocent imagination. What about mental illness? Could that be an explanation for the spirits? Hypothetically, but I don't have evidence for this. Uh, in the first place, I can't diagnose someone at a distance. In fact, I'm not qualified to diagnose mental illness in any professional way, though I can look for its signs and speculate on it. But I don't have grounds for that here. Uh, everybody has mental quirks, but nothing in Joe's book provides evidence that Aviva or Claire or Joe, for that matter, was mentally ill, not to the point that they'd be having hallucinations or delusions of that were capable of producing the spirit guides. And I'm not going to speculate that someone is mentally ill without significant evidence. Also, mental illness would not explain the better than random chance knowledge that Aviva sometimes produced. Then what about misunderstanding? Could Aviva and Claire have been getting better than random chance knowledge by their own ESP and then misunderstanding its source, thinking that it was coming from spirits rather than their own abilities? This is a more serious possibility. In fact, it's a classic problem in parapsychology. Just because you have a medium producing information in a paranormal way, how do you know whether they're really talking to a spirit or whether it's really just their own ESP? The latter possibility is referred to by saying that living agent psi, meaning the psychic abilities of a living person, might be producing the information. This is also sometimes called the super psi hypothesis, and it's very hard to distinguish between it and the spirit hypothesis. There have been some advances in this area recently, such as by monitoring the brain waves of mediums when they're talking to a spirit versus when they're trying to be psychic. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a future episode, but neither Aviva nor Claire was having their brain waves tested when they were doing sessions. So I can't distinguish between the two possibilities on an evidential basis in this case. Can you distinguish between them on another basis? Yeah, I am a big fan of what's sometimes called phenomenal conservatism. In philosophy, phenomenal conservatism means that you assume experiences are as they present themselves until you get evidence that they should be taken some other way. We all use this principle every day. If you come home and a woman who appears to be your wife serves dinner, you should assume that it really is your wife serving dinner until you get evidence that it's not. You'd be paranoid to assume without evidence that it's your wife's evil twin who you have no previous evidence of and that she's serving you a poisoned meal in order to collect insurance money. 
you know, phenomenal conservatism is the only non-paranoid way to navigate life. So when we see something that appears to be communication with the spirit, and there's evidence that something paranormal is really happening, then the logical thing to do is prefer the hypothesis that it isn't living agent psi, that it is the spirit communication that it presents itself as. Consequently, unless this is a case of conscious fraud, I think we should assume that Joe was dealing with guides that were actual spirits rather than just living agent psi or ESP. What do you make of his conclusion that they were deceptive, hungry ghost spirits of deceased humans? I think it's a very interesting hypothesis that should be taken seriously. One thing that is very clear from reading the book is that the situation involved a lot of manipulation. And assuming that the manipulation wasn't coming from the mediums, then it was coming from the spirits. I won't go through all the evidence for manipulation in detail, since we've already covered how both Russell and Dr. Pinkerton were trying to get Sanford and Joe to sleep with Aviva and Claire. Um, in Joe's case, the manipulation with respect to Claire wasn't extensive, but everything that happened with Philippa, his dream lover guide, was very manipulative. And wow, the manipulation of Sanford was really extensive. I mean, break up with your wife, rush over at a moment's notice and put your hands all over Aviva's body or she'll die and confess your love for each other. Uh, yikes, manipulation much? And there's that whole, are you a soul or an entity thing? That's designed to make most attendees who will be declared entities feel like they're special. And telling people that they're special is a way of manipulating them. Well, if this manipulation was coming from the spirits, then we're dealing with deceptive, manipulative spirits, and that fits Joe's hungry ghost proposal. I also think that his suggestion that these were human spirits that hadn't moved on to the next realm is very interesting. It would explain why they were interested in manipulating living humans, why they didn't want to be called spirits, why they didn't want to talk about their deaths, and why they were interested in re-experiencing elements of earthly life and earthly pleasures. Do we have evidence from other sources that would suggest the existence of spirits of this type? Actually, we do. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, such spirits are called dibbuks. Uh, they don't like the fact that they're discarnate, that they no longer have bodies, and they may try to take possession of the body of a living person. We'll have a future episode on dibbuks. And there are reports of dibbuks in Christian history as well, where someone who had died temporarily took possession of a living human and tried to re-experience earthly pleasures through them, so we'll be hearing about that as well. Incidentally, St. Thomas Aquinas agreed that things like this or similar to this are possible. He held that in some cases, God could allow even the souls of damned humans to manifest on earth. What about Joe's idea that a truly spiritual entity would not really want to communicate with living humans, at least verbally, so that the only spirits that would want to communicate would be lying, manipulative ones like his hungry ghosts. Here I'm afraid that I disagree with Joe. Uh, Joe's father was a Baptist minister, so he had a Protestant upbringing. And one of the things that is historically common in Protestantism, though it's by no means universal, is the idea that all spirit activity tends to be explained in terms of evil, deceptive spirits, usually demons. This actually goes all the way back to Martin Luther, and it was his way of discounting reports of apparitions of the saints and of ghosts that had been reported in Christianity for the previous 1,500 years. I've uh, read in Luther's writings where he says not to listen to ghosts, that they're all deceptive because they want, uh, the way he, he knows this, that they're deceptive is kind of interesting. He says it's because they always want to have mass said for them. And the mass was, in Luther's view, a bad thing, and so was purgatory. So if a spirit from purgatory shows up and asks you to say prayers or have mass said, it must be a lying spirit in Luther's view. And don't get him started about the Virgin Mary and other saints appearing from heaven and showing up and saying stuff to you. Well, this idea that it, the really spiritual spirits, the ones up in heaven, not being interested in talking to living humans, went on to influence the Protestant movement as a whole, though fortunately there are those in the Protestant community today who are rethinking this. 
But when Joe got into the mediumistic world and had a bad experience, he basically defaulted back to the kind of view he grew up with, where the really spiritual spirits won't be talking with the living. Typically, only the nasty, deceptive ones will. But I disagree with that view. As we've covered in previous episodes, there is good evidence that saints from heaven sometimes appear to people, and there's good evidence that souls that are being purified and are on their way to heaven sometimes appear. And most recently, we covered the fact that between 40 and 50% of the population report having at least one communication with a departed loved one during their lives. You can listen to episode 306 and also episode 307 on after-death communications on that. That's, uh, you can find them at mysterious.fm slash 306 and mysterious.fm slash 307. So I think Joe is mistaken about this, and we actually have considerable evidence of non-deceptive spirits taking an interest in talking with the living. At this point, we're crossing over into the faith perspective. What about the possibility that Joe considered but didn't settle on? Could he have been speaking to demons? Well, the short answer is yes, he could have been, and there is some evidence in support of his proposal, which we'll get to. And I want to underscore this point because people often forget aspects of what I say. So I'm underlining the fact that it is possible Joe was talking to demons. However, I should also point out first that it would be very easy for me to just say that these guides were demons and leave it at that. I could even point to Joe's suicide as evidence of what mediumistic communications with spirits will do to you. That would fit a widespread narrative, and it would be very easy for me to just endorse it. But regular listeners of the show know that I try to consider all the alternatives, and I try to only endorse the ones that have evidence supporting them. In this case, we have a situation where mediumistic communication went badly. Joe had a very negative experience with it. In fact, that's why I wanted to cover this story, because you don't get an accurate picture if you only look at good experiences or only look at bad experiences. You need to look at both the good and the bad in order to have an accurate and realistic understanding. So I wanted to cover this because negative mediumistic experiences do happen. We need to be aware of that, and we need to cover such experiences on the show as a warning of what can happen. I'm thus all on board with those who would point to Joe's experience as a warning. However, we can't automatically leap from there to the demon hypothesis, as we discussed in episode 188 on whether it's always demons. You can go to mysterious.fm slash 188 for more on that. We need evidence to propose demons, and in this case, there is some evidence. What would you point to as evidence for demonic involvement here? I won't go through everything I could cite because the episode's already getting long, but I'll point out some of the main things. First, from a point of view of the Christian faith, demons are lying manipulators, and we have considerable evidence of lying and manipulation here. Second, demons want to lead people away from the Christian faith, and boy, did these guides try to do that. Uh, First, there's the soul entity distinction. There's actually a historical parallel to this in the Gnostic heretics from the early centuries. Some Gnostics thought that there were two kinds of humans, those that had a spark of the divine in them and those that didn't. This is contrary to the Christian faith, which holds that all humans are the same, What determines your level of spirituality is your own free will, not whether you're naturally part of some special kind of human. Uh, Second, there's all this stuff about the origin and destiny of man, where human entities come from a great pool of knowledge, and their destiny is to go back to that pool of knowledge and surrender their individuality. That is completely different from the Christian vision of us being resurrected and having an eternal, loving, and individual relationship with God. Third, there's all the stuff about reincarnation, which contradicts Hebrews 9.27, which says that it's appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment, not an infinite series of lives. Fourth, and most importantly, there's the idea that Jesus is just an ordinary man who's no more spiritually advanced than Joe or any other member of Aviva's group. That's directly 
contradictory to the Christian understanding of Jesus as the incarnate Son of God. So Aviva's guides were trying to lead her and her followers away from the Christian faith. And so from a Christian perspective, that's exactly what you'd expect demons to do. So there is evidence that demons could have been involved. If that's the evidence for demonic involvement, do you see any evidence that could be cited against demonic involvement? Yes. Why are the demons so bad at producing accurate information about specific individuals? On any of the other theories, I can understand this. If the situation was due to conscious fraud, I can understand it. In that case, if Eva had enough background knowledge or had done enough research that she could come up with accurate information on general subjects, but she didn't have the knowledge needed to document specific individuals like the lives of that Ernest, Harry, Russell, and Philippa claim to have lived. Similarly, if mediums were, if the mediums were using living agent ESP to get information, I can see that only some of it would be accurate because human ESP is unreliable. Uh, studies suggest that it produces better than chance results, but not super accurate results. So we'd expect a bunch of mistakes among the true bits. Also, if the guides were human spirits who were lying about who they were, then they would be using their own human level side to find out stuff, and that could be unreliable as well. Even if they weren't lying about who they were, they were still speaking through a human medium, though, and the human medium was using unreliable, living human psi. And so that might have been what introduced the errors. So that would not be unexpected. The Winbridge Research Center did one experiment with a set of highly qualified research mediums. Um, these mediums who were mediums who had been specially tested and were known for their accuracy. The experiment was conducted under rigorous quintuple blind conditions where nobody involved in the experiment knew anything more than the first name of the deceased. The medium never at any time came into contact with the client, and the medium was asked specific questions about the deceased, such as what their hair and eye colors were, how tall they were, what their job was, what their hobbies were, their favorite foods, their cause of death, how old they were at the time of death, and so forth. And even among these highly qualified research mediums, the rate of accuracy on the questions was 53%. That's clearly above random chance. I mean, you couldn't guess anywhere near that level of accuracy just by random guessing about a person you had no information on. So 53% is impressive, but it isn't magic total accuracy. So I wouldn't expect Aviva or Claire to have super total accuracy, but I would expect accuracy from demons. On the Christian view, angels and demons are created spiritual beings, and they're smarter and more powerful than human spirits, so they should have more powerful psychic abilities. Their telepathy should be more powerful, as they have no physical mouths, so telepathy is the way they normally communicate. Similarly, their clairvoyance should be much more powerful, since they have no physical senses, so clairvoyance is the way they perceive our world. So if demons were possessing Aviva and Claire... I'd expect them to be able to come up with much more accurate information. And if they're trying to lead people away from the Christian faith, then they'd be motivated to come up with accurate, convincing information about the guide's supposed past lives. So why didn't they? You know, this doesn't make sense to me. I thus see it as evidence that could count against the demon hypothesis in this case. So I see the evidence regarding demons in this case as being mixed. There's some evidence that supports it, like the manipulation, the temptation to commit sins, like the seduction attempts, and the leading away from the Christian faith. But there's also evidence against it, like the very notable lack of accuracy in coming up with past life stories. It seems like you're entertaining three main theories that could explain the guides. Conscious fraud lying human spirits, and demons. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the evidence for these three theories? Well, this is stepping back into the reason perspective for a moment, but one of the things I was struck by is the same pattern that Joe noted in his book. The spirits did appear to come up with beyond chance accurate information on certain kinds of topics. These were general things about a time period. 
but they spectacularly fail to come up with information about specific past individuals. And I found myself wondering what could explain those patterns. I think that they could be explained on a conscious fraud hypothesis. Aviva may have had enough background knowledge and done enough research to produce accurate general level knowledge by a combination of cold and hot reading. But if she chose her guides for people whenever they showed up at one of her sessions, you know, like Joe was told about his guide the first time he came, and she hadn't researched particular historical people in advance, then she'd need to make up the details about the guide on the spot. And that would explain why these particular details were so inaccurate. So the conscious fraud hypothesis could explain the data pattern we see. Similarly, if Joe's hungry ghosts hypothesis is accurate, then that also would explain the pattern. You'll recall that he proposed that the spirits had an unhealthy attachment to their earthly lives and didn't like talking about or thinking about their deaths, which is why they pretended to be somebody else. If that were the case, then maybe Philippa really was the spirit of a Greek woman, and based on Dr. Thaniel's analysis of her speech, which he dated to between the years of 1912 and 1920, and the knowledge that she seemed to display of the Balkan Wars, which took place in 1912 and 1913, and other knowledge of the early 20th century in Greece that she displayed, maybe Philippa was the spirit of a woman who died in Greece sometime between 1912 and 1920, but then she pretended to be a woman from the mid-1700s. Thus, on Joe's Hungry Ghosts hypothesis, or the Dybbuk hypothesis as we might call it, Philippa would have enough knowledge of Greece and its history to fake the general stuff that was accurate, but she wouldn't have the detailed knowledge of the mid-1700s needed to provide accurate information about a woman living then. I can thus see how the Hungry Ghost Dybbuk hypothesis could also explain the data pattern we see. However, I don't see why demons would fit this pattern. Uh, you know, I mean, if they really wanted to get their demon message out, then they would want to give Joe accurate information about past people that could be verified. They wouldn't want him to falsify their story. And then he writes a book warning against the exact way they're trying to trick people. So I think demons are possible, but I tend to favor the first two hypotheses. Unless it's all three or four, because it doesn't have to be just one. One of the things that they stress in classes about paranormal investigations is that there may be more than one explanation for what's going on in a particular case, including both normal and paranormal ones. So it's possible that in Aviva and Claire's cases, some of it may have been conscious fraud. Some of it may have been living agent psi. Some of it may have been hungry ghosts or dibbocks. And some of it may have been demons. Not having been on the scene, I haven't done my own investigation, and thus I can't say for sure. Before we go, let's talk about the sad way today's story ended, with Joe's suicide. What should we say here? Were the spirits actually involved? It's really hard to say. Uh, what we know is that Joe at least thought that he may have been attacked or harassed by the ghosts. Um, for example, when he had his case of omphalitis, he thought he, it might have been caused by Dr. Pinkerton because of how Claire called him while he was still in the hospital and nobody knew where he was. Well, that is certainly a striking event, but it doesn't prove that it was a psychic attack. In the first place, as we'll discuss in future episodes, psychic attacks tend not to be very effective. And in the second place, Claire could have called him without it being a psychic attack at all. For example, she may have used her own ESP to detect the fact that Joe was in the hospital and then interpreted this as a message from Dr. Pinkerton. Or maybe Dr. Pinkerton did tell her, but he didn't cause the omphalitis. He just was aware of it and let Claire know that Joe was in the hospital, perhaps in hopes of reeling Joe back into the world of mediums. Either way, this doesn't have to be a psychic attack. We also know that Joe felt the spirits were harassing him later on, as he indicated in his last message to the editor-in-chief of his publishing house, and apparently in comments to others he knew. But given everything else that was going on in his life, this could have just been his imagination. If you've had bad experiences with spirits and then everything in your life falls apart, you're going to go through a dark night of the soul, you know, the planned topic of his next book, and 
you might well imagine that you're being harassed by spirits, even if you're not. Unfortunately, without doing an on-the-spot investigation that we can't do, there's no way to say whether there was any negative spirit activity here or not. It's possible, but it's not at all certain. Joe's suicide may have been for purely natural causes, including him imagining that spirits were harassing him when they weren't. Anything else we should say on the topic of suicide? There are two things that we always need to say when suicide comes up on the program. The first is that although suicide is a grave sin, it doesn't mean that a person who commits it is automatically lost. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states, Suicide contradicts the natural inclination of the human being to preserve and perpetuate his life. It is gravely contrary to the just love of self. It likewise offends love of neighbor because it unjustly breaks the ties of solidarity with family, nation, and other human societies in which we continue to have obligations. Suicide is contrary to love for the living God. If suicide is committed with the intention of setting an example, especially to the young, it also takes on the gravity of scandal. Voluntary cooperation in suicide is contrary to the moral law. Grave psychological disturbances, anguish, or grave fear of hardship, suffering, or torture can diminish the responsibility of the one committing suicide. We should not despair of the eternal salvation of persons who have taken their own lives. By ways known to Him alone, God can provide the opportunity for salutary repentance. The Church prays for persons who have taken their own lives. CCC 2281 to 2283. Therefore, I would invite all of the listeners to pray for Joe, that he was not responsible or not fully responsible for having taken his life, and that he either is with God in heaven or is on his way to heaven. If you'd like to know more about that kind of prayer, be sure to listen to episode 208 on time travel prayer. You can access it by going to mysterious.fm slash 208. The second thing we need to say is for anyone who may hear this episode and is thinking about suicide. Suicide is not the answer. It is not a cure-all for your problems. If you don't deal with the problems in this life, you'll just need to deal with them in the next. But there is hope and there is help. You can feel better. And if you commit yourself to dealing with the causes of your problems, you will feel better. And there are people to help. Here in the United States, you can just call the number 988. Help is available 24 hours a day in both English and Spanish. And if you live in another part of the world, help is available where you are too. Just Google the phrase suicide helpline and your local resources will come up. Finally, I'd like to invite the listeners to pray for everyone who may be thinking about suicide, that they find the peace, help, compassion, and relief that they need in this life. Jimmy, what's your bottom line here? This is a really interesting and difficult case. It provides a concrete example of how things in a mediumistic context can go wrong. Joe wanted to write about his experience as a warning to others, and I think it's a warning we need to take seriously, which is why I wanted to cover this mystery. Things like this can happen. At the same time, I disagree with Joe that the only spirits that would want to communicate with the living are malicious tricksters. We have a lot of evidence that ordinary people communicate with their loved ones at least briefly after death, and there is evidence of saints from heaven and souls from purgatory communicating with people as well. When it comes to the explanations for the spirits in Joe's case, I can't narrow it down to a single explanation not having been able to do a first-hand investigation of these events while they were going on. Unlike Joe, I'm not prepared to rule out the possibility of conscious fraud. It's also possible that living agent Psy was responsible, though I doubt this. I find Joe's explanation of hungry ghosts or dibbucks interesting and worth considering. It's possible that demons could have been involved, though I wouldn't know why they weren't more accurate than they were if that was the case. And it's even possible that it, all four of these explanations are in play. So there are elements of this case that remain a mystery. So Jimmy, what further resources can we offer everyone? We'll have a link to Joe Fisher's book, The Siren Call of Hungry Ghosts. 
Uh, also, the article about Joe Fisher in the Science Encyclopedia, Lauren Coleman's obituary for Joe Fisher, Lewis Proud's article on Joe Fisher and his death, and also an, uh, information about Asian hungry ghosts and how they actually work. And now it's time to hear from you. What are your theories about what Joe Fisher discovered about his hungry ghosts? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did on this episode. You can check it out by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And as you know, I'm trying to grow my channel and I'd really appreciate your help. If you like and uh, comment on the video, then that will tell YouTube you thought it was noteworthy and the algorithm will show it to more people. And also, please do subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video. There's usually several a week now. So thank you very much. I also want to say a special thanks to Professor Daniel Levine for his help with the Greek, uh, the modern, more modern Greek, and also a uh, special thanks to Rob Mady for his voiceover work on this episode. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be talking about a strange phenomenon known as terminal lucidity. It's what happens when someone has become mentally disabled, sometimes for years, like with Alzheimer's disease. And yet, just before they die, they suddenly regain full mental function and have the chance to say a last goodbye to their loved ones. It's a mystery involving hope that may shed light on the very essence of human nature. And folks, be sure to share the podcast with your friends, write a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from to help us grow this community and reach more listeners. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 311. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. And by... The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Quest.